The growing season has been all too short in the Northland, but as always, there are gifts from the garden to celebrate. We'll look at some of the vibrant color and nourishing plant life that came out of the 2014 season and look ahead at what's still to come this fall, plus expectations for next year's yards and gardens on Great Gardening, straight ahead. We celebrate each year um, as we receive it. For good nutrition, we need a balance of colors. I like to can because I'm a gardener. We brought home an orchard for our community. This was just an overgrown area full of bramble. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish with this hour-long Harvest Moon Special Edition. And I'm here with our resident experts, Tom Casper, the president of the Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin, educator and horticulturist with St. Louis County. So glad to have you guys back. <laughs> Boy, I know that uh, you have been busy getting it all done during uh, what what is really a condensed garden term this year. And it's all done, right, Tom? Yeah, it's all done. <laughs> We're almost all well, done. No. What a great name for the show, Special Harvest Moon, since we just had a Harvest just Moon a couple days Tuesday, ago. Just had yes. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful. But things are changing out there in the skies, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And we may have some frost in the area. And... Uh, yeah. We're going to talk a little bit more about that coming up. But first, we want to welcome our phone volunteers from the Master Gardeners of St. Louis County. They're here to answer your called in questions. Uh, we know that you uh, have some perplexing ones that you've been holding on to for the last several weeks. So please call them at 218 788 2844 or call toll free 877 307 8762. You can also email questions to askgardening at wdse.org. And if you'd like to make a pledge of support to this public television station, they can help you with that as well. Well, gentlemen, not only a lot of swings in weather conditions over the entire season, but also just this week. Just this week and throughout the region, where right in the greater Duluth area, we had continuous rain through much of the season. There are parts a little bit farther north where it was really very dry. So it's been highly, highly variable through the in entire growing season, I'd say. Yeah, and, and certainly a slow start. I mean, really, our, our program was wrapping up uh, in June, the mm -hmm. major part of the, the program. regular season. Yeah, and many people still hadn't gotten their gardens in yet. So we, we certainly have had our challenges, but then warmth came and and ample rain certainly in our area as well as other areas. So. But now the possibility of frost and uh, I want to ask you what are we doing at this point to protect or do we just need to get everything out of the garden? No I think uh, frost is frost rather than freezes. Now some areas may actually have extreme cold temperatures down around below 28 degrees but certainly 32 or 30 you want to get out and you want to protect all your frost sensitive plants as an example, there's a, there's a lot of winter squash, there are pumpkins. If the plant tissue is still green, the tissue can be very sensitive, not necessarily the fruit, but you want to keep them green. So I, I really think covering with uh, any type of blanket material is going to be a real good idea over the next uh, night or two. So something um, fabric? Fabric, Some people I really think use is the plastic best. maybe? Can you use plastic? You certainly can. It'll, it'll help a little bit, but really fabric has higher insulating value, and if you can get any kind of a blanketed material, any kind of a quilted material. And early in the season, because there's heat in the Earth's crust, mm -hmm. you can actually hold a lot of temperatures. So if you have an insulated blanket, you might be able to get uh, six, eight degrees out of that early in the season like this. And so say it gets down to, I don't, I don't want to get too technical with the math, but say it gets down to, to <laughs> 27. 27. Easy to, easy to protect this time of year with, with some kind of a fabric. How blanket. low can we go? How low can we go? <laughs> well, I can limbo about that, that far. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm thinking if you can protect down to 27 or 25, you've done really pretty well. All right. Easier to do now because there's heat still uh, than it is a little bit later in the season. You try to do that at the end of October and it becomes more of a challenge. But you can, you can protect quite a ways down. And, and they're right. really talking about the Duluth proper area and into Wisconsin right. not getting below 32. That's so it's right. outside of the area in the northern parts of our region. Northern so. and a little bit farther south away from the lake where yeah. there's a lake right. effect. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of the things we got earlier in the season that did really well. And we're going to start with this Swiss chart. 
Leafy greens. It was a wet, moist year for most folks, and uh, the greens did extremely well. Swiss chard, a variety called El Dorado, loaded with nutrition. And this has been the backbone for years and years. Uh, the native residents, the, the native homesteading farmers grew in the left here, Savoy cabbage and beautiful broccoli. That's a variety called uh, Green Magic Spectacular. And it did well again. Now, tell us about this. This is a, an eggplant plant and you've got a yardstick by it. Well, I made the comment. I'd seen so much stretch early in the season. And I've got, I said I've got eggplant that are uh, a yard long and people thought I was kidding. So I actually did take a yardstick. And, some of the eggplants were in fact 36 and 40 inches tall in the month of June. There was quite a bit of stretch, overcast conditions, and then uh, not a lot of bright light. The potato nice crop Nice potatoes, were, right. They were spectacular. You can see the yields were tremendous this year. So potatoes were again good. Now tomatoes might be another issue. Uh, yeah. There's gonna be a lot of green tomato relish out there. Variety, the key takeaway point is selecting proper short season varieties. All the short season varieties did well. This is a purple basil. All the herbs did extremely well. Lettuce, herbs, salad crops just thrived in this entire season. Mm -hmm. And Tom, I heard so many people just gush about the beauty of their flower gardens. Right, yeah, it's been, again, a slow start for us, but many of the flowers really responded nicely. Um, like peonies, they were a little slow, but uh, certainly when they came into bloom, and for many of us that live closer to the lake, well, bloom well into July, um, and then delphiniums blooming in look at in, that uh, color. Yeah, in mid July as well, just outstanding color. Hollyhocks, a tremendous year for hollyhocks, and and as Bob and I had commented earlier um, during our, our setup, that uh, not seeing a lot of rust with them this year. So most people had a pretty good year for hollyhocks. Uh, Asiatic lilies, some of the lilies are still in bloom here closer to the lake. This one's a variety, a favorite of mine called lollipop. Um, and easy and outstanding to grow. Black-eyed Susans, here we've kind of got a mix of uh, some annual black-eyed Susans, Susans as well as uh, Rubeckia Goldstrom. Still then, seeing a lot of those out right still now. Still in bloom and looking great. Liatris in the foreground. And then our echinaceas, you know, for years they had been taking a beating because we just hadn't gotten the snow and we were getting the cold. Uh, but with the early snow last year and early December, uh, before the cold temps came, echinaceas have done really well. Right. Uh, you can see this is a variety called Picabella, and then there's a pincushion one behind it, that pink one that you see as well. So They're gorgeous. Well, thank yeah. you so much for the overview of some of the things that did well. Um, if you pick but don't grow your own raspberries, you may have noticed a shortage this year. Here's Bob to explain that. We have an insect pest that's creating quite a bit of concern, not just in Minnesota, but nationally. The spotted wing Drosophila, which is a fly, and uh, it can devastate the mature fruit. Our commercial growers uh, don't know how to handle a pest because right now you'd rather not use pesticides of any type. And because this particular fly attacks the ripe fruit and even some of the more benign, less toxic materials have got waiting periods on them. So it's a, it's a real challenge for commercial growers. Uh, we really don't know how to address that at this particular point. So uh, our larger commercial growers, uh, some of them just have decided they're not gonna fight the fight any longer and have given up on commercial production. So this is where a home patch is gonna be real valuable to people. One of the real nice aspects of a small home raspberry patch is that you don't necessarily attract these pests. It's when we get into Larger plantings, very substantial, that they, they tend to locate them and find them. But isolated patches, we, we can be nearly pest free at least at this point. So we're seeing it in northern Minnesota, we're seeing it on large plantings, but I've not seen it on small patches or home patches like this, which is great. So again, uh, may see some problems uh, in the commercial um, production of raspberries, but other berries doing well. Yeah, and, and raspberries, you notice the pollinators, the bees, the native bees, really raspberries are a tremendous mm -hmm. attraction. We really want to provide habitat for our pollinators. So staying away from pesticides is really important. And if you can just have isolated patches, I think that's that's right. one thing that the homeowner can do. But the rest of the berry, the blueberry crop was spectacular. Yeah. 
the uh, June June bearing strawberries, which of course uh, were here about the third week in July this year, but nonetheless they were spectacular. Mm -hmm. So overall, it was a tremendous small fruit year. For berries, great. <laughs> we have uh, a number of questions on hydrangea. Jeannie in Duluth says, "How do I dry Annabelle hydrangea?" Oh, we haven't had that question yeah. before. Yeah, uh, actually, really easy to do, Jeannie. As it starts to cool down, she can go and cut. Cut them, they'll dry right in place or, mm -hmm. or tie them, hang them up in the garage or a cool uh, dry place. Let them um, just self dry over a couple of weeks and they're probably going to be good for years. Really? So okay. Here. Now we have um, another hydrangea question. Patty in Lakeside has a five year old one that didn't flower this year and she wonders why it has flowered in the past and appears healthy, but no flowers this year. You know, it could again been, been the season. And you know, something else that happens is uh, treat. Trees tend to grow up around garden areas. Mm. In more cases than not, we get a little more shade. So really, good flowering requires good sun. May have been a factor, again, of uh, what we had in June, depending on when they were going to flower. I've noticed some of the PGs, which normally would flower late in the season, are spectacular right now. Mm -hmm. so, okay, and but, one more hydrangea oh. question, and then we'll get to that uh, video tour. Tony in Brimson, a hydrangea in its second year hasn't bloomed. Now, uh, Tony says uh, that she found a new home for it. When can it be moved? Uh, pretty much starting now or within a couple of weeks, okay. move it as it cools down. You know, with these cooler temps around us, now would be a great time. Um, and we're seeing a lot uh, as well of, of hydrangeas that have bloomed for years that just didn't bloom this year because of what mm. happened in June. So sure. not to panic. Sure. Okay. Well, we're getting a lot of questions. We'll get to those in just a bit. But first, we visited some amazing flower gardens this summer. For many, the design and construction is self-made, but others find collaboration with a local professional their best option. That's the case at this couple's supper, summer home in northwest Wisconsin. Where we're in Bayfield, Wisconsin, overlooking Lake Superior. I'm Betty DeMars, and he's John. And welcome to our garden. It started out with the idea of a pond. That a pond. <laughs> gradually grew into three ponds and more extensive gardens. We were pretty open as to what happened. Uh, Richard was the person with the ideas, and we just went with it. Well, John and Betty uh, got in touch with me to come and have a look. And um, it was really basically just a field that had a lot of heavy uh, equipment over it when they were building the golf course. It had a lot of sumac and a lot of, of weeds. So it was, um, it, was, it was rough to begin with. And they wanted a water garden. So uh, we began really just to um, completely clear the whole site. Part of what I like about the gardens is not just the big splashy things, it's the little things along the paths, um, the little flowers that are coming up or these that pop. It's just, that's part of what I really like the most rather than the big wow factor ones. And the little mosses here with the little white flowers are some of my favorite. The pinks are just great. They're just ready to pop. And then this yellow that's all throughout my garden, that's called moneywort or creeping jenny. It's really invasive, but it, it's, just fantastic it goes right into the water I love the flow of it I, I love the, the gentle flow the nicest part is the color that he's brought in yeah all seasons it has color and it just seems to be changing continuously but we had something in mind that was going to be a little more natural and probably need less care we hadn't thought of such a formal setting but we're very happy with what he's done it's mm -hmm. a little more of an English garden look to it we have two different white of the um, astilbes. This one that's really thick and full, and then just more of the feathery ones back there, which I really, really like. And he just felt like we needed something to centralize things and a place to sit so we could enjoy. So we do actually sit and enjoy looking here, looking at the ponds, and then the view of Lake Superior. And then I added this clematis on the poles um, this last year, and all of them have started blooming except for that one there, which is a white one. This is bugbane, do you know that? Isn't that just beautiful? Again, we weren't sure about the name, so I did research, and I got a few more of them for over there, but isn't that beautiful? This is called lynches. Richard got this plant and, and put a, oh, maybe three down there. We, neither of us knew the name. Well, you will see it's all over my garden now. 
almost like lambs here. And that's the place where the lynches started. And isn't it a nice color? He loves roses, and there are some be beautiful, that one right there with the red and white is just spectacular. They were really winter hardy. Then there's these Icelandic poppies, at least that's what I call them, these um, tiny ones, and then you'll see some in the path too. They're just so sweet. I don't know what I really would do if I didn't have help in between times. I kind of come and I'm spoiled that quite a bit of the weeding has been done. Uh, but then I love coming and working. It's a lot more pleasurable doing it here. I mean, mine at home are maintained and I just put in a few annuals. I mean, here there is not an annual in the gardens. It, it isn't as pleasurable uh, just doing it on, on my own. I've certainly learned a lot from him and, and just from the experience of of doing this. And coming up, we'll hear more from South Shore landscaper Richard Allen about how the project came together. Well, as often the case, uh, we get questions from people that maybe send in an illustration. And here's an example of th that. Now, this came from Sandy Keeley in Buell, and she said uh, she had these um, green globes growing on her shrub roses. They turned brown. She's wondering, are they harmful, and how can I get rid of them? Well, you know, when you first look at it, uh, you might confuse these actual galls with uh, rose hips, which is actually the, uh, the rose flower. And actually, I think uh, these were caused by an insect that's actually deposited an egg. And some of these were actually deposited right where the flower would be forming, so it looks like an enlarged rose hip. But in fact, those are galls caused by insects. Nothing she can do at this point, not really too harmful to the plant. The only way would be to use uh, some type of a of a pesticide earlier in the season, and since they're not doing any harm, we try to discourage some of that. And anyway. anything needs to be done at the end of the season with those? Yeah, you should prune those out. And okay. you should prune them about a foot down from where that gall okay. has formed. Uh, the insect will overwinter in that area, so good cleanup and get that uh, infected tissue off site. Right. So don't compost them, get them into your garbage and hauled away. So. Okay, thanks for the response to that. I know Sandy's been waiting patiently for it. Ted from Superior wants to know, will spaghetti squash handle a frost or should he cover it? Again, a good question. If, if the plant tissue is still green, I would cover. Uh, the, the actual fruit itself uh, will take uh, 30 degrees or so, but I, if they aren't mature yet, by all means, cover. So okay. spaghetti teddy. Spaghetti <laughs> Teddy, I like that one. Uh, one more on this one on potatoes. Are my potatoes still growing or should I dig them up? If they're still green, uh, they're probably adding uh, ad additional size, so additional yield. Your choice at this point, they're probably new. And there was a very late crop for some of the potatoes. Still green, they're still growing, they're still adding yield. One more, Tom, before we move on. Susie in Maple wants to know what's the best way to carry over geraniums and when should I make cuttings? Well, uh, she can make cuttings in the spring, probably around March would be the best time to do that. There's a couple different ways. You can bring them in, dry them down, put them in a cool place, and just keep them very lightly watered. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of moisture or they're going to rot on her. The other would be to bring them in, get them into a nice sunny spot, try to grow them throughout the season, and then cutting them back about March 1st. All right, sounds good. More uh, questions and answers coming up in just a bit. But trees are an important part of most landscapes and gardens, and it takes some special care to see them succeed in those settings. So what kind of effort does it take to recreate a forest? Well, some Duluth school kids found out after helping reestablish the white pine forest on Minnesota's North Shore. They planted and cared for dozens and dozens of pines at Brighton Beach six and seven years ago, then returned for a dedication last month. They have the name, so when the kids planted them, there was a little um, pinfoil tag that if you wrote on it with a ballpoint pen, it made an impression. This is mine? Oh, it's barely taller than me. We planted the trees together and I remember watering them, coming back to look at them, see how they've grown. Because I planted it when I was really young and now coming back to see it grown, it's really interesting because everybody's growing. I grew a lot and so did the tree, so it's like kind of a childhood memory coming back to it. We were young, we thought it was really interesting to create our own little forest and see how it would go as we got older. I was surprised to see my tree so big. I didn't think it would get that big by now, but it's really grown. 
Many of them have come back to visit several times, and the hope is they'll continue to do so. A whole community supported this project, including St. Louis County, University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardeners, the County Land Department, and the City of Duluth. And Bob, we know you were really involved in that, and what a fun project. Fun project, and actually they laughed initially because we had to cage each of those trees, but we now have a white pine forest. That area burned in 1918 and had not been reestablished, mainly because of the white-tailed deer population. So this is a technique that's now being adopted other places. Wow, great success. All right, we have time for a few more questions before we move on. Julie from uh, Poplar says, my container grown tomato plant had brown spots on the leaves. Eventually all the leaves died, even though tomatoes were produced. What's going on there? Well, it's one of two fungal diseases. It could be either early blight or septoria leaf spot, both fungal, and I wouldn't be at all surprised in this kind of a year with the moisture. Plant tissue dies down, which tends to push along the ripening a little bit, but it impacts yield. So really, ideally, you want to keep that plant as healthy as you possibly can. More than anything, just a function of the intense moist conditions that we had this year. Okay. And a, a couple things you can do uh, to help try to avoid those. One of them is watering early in the day, so rather than when she got home from work, water and getting the foliage wet, or if she does have to water in the evening or late afternoon, water at the base, trying to keep that splash or motion of water splashing onto the leaves down will help with that too, potentially. Okay. Uh, Sue from Proctor wants to know, when should I trim my asparagus plants and when should I fertilize them? You know, you're gonna fertilize in the spring. As long as they're green, let, let them continue to grow. The re-sprout, the, the one critical factor is stop harvesting about the 4th of July because you need that green fern up there to recover, for the root to recover and, and get ready for the next season. Okay. All right. Well, we're expecting more questions to come in. We do have some uh, that we're going to get to a little bit later, but please uh, keep calling in. And now a look at some of the plantings and discoveries from our friends and neighbors in the gardening community. And then we'll take a short break, but we will be back with the second half of our Harvest Moon special. Here's this week's Growing Show. Gail Markley of Britt, Minnesota, grew some dinner plate dahlias this year that clearly outshined the other plantings in the bed. Gail also had success with bright petunias in both the window box and in the container she arranged with whimsical decoratives in the yard. Dennis and Judy Longshore were pleased at the potato crop harvested from their place in Poplar, Wisconsin, a great team effort resulting in some tasty meals. These cone flowers grown by Denise Farwell in Duluth stand out in front of the lilies and other lush perennials in her woodland yard. Nearby, a live and lively planting weaves among the metal sunflower display that sits before an active beehive. These crimson-colored Asiatic lilies are a real hot spot in the garden of Jessica Francisco of Duluth. Betty Carpen says she misses the monarch butterflies like this one she photographed on her pansies two seasons past. At nearly 70 years of age, Betty notices a decline in the number of monarchs that were once abundant in the gardens of her Silver Bay home. Meanwhile, in Clam Lake, Wisconsin, this past summer, Janice McDougal bore witness to a monarch emerging from its chrysalis. Janice says the display of nature brought some unexpected joy to the task of weeding the flower bed. If you have pictures of nature on display, send them our way. The email address is greatgardening at wdse.org. Good evening, I'm Britta Edgerton with my coworker Greg Grell, and thank you for joining us on this special edition of Great Gardening. We've been busy getting ready for the next season next year, but we do need a little bit of help to make it successful. That's right, so we're hoping that you'll help us fertilize Great Gardening for the upcoming season as you get ready to put your gardens to bed for the year. We're preparing to bring you another uh, series or another season of the series this coming spring. So right now we're encouraging you to call in and make a donation to help support Great Gardening and all the other great programs here on Public TV. It's very simple to do. We've got some great phone volunteers who are standing by waiting to take your calls right now. So dial that number on your screen uh, and make that telephone call immediately to get a prompt service. 
And when you become a member of Public Television tonight, you're going to be getting some great thank you gifts. And one is uh, a DVD of Garden Tips. They're featuring uh, over, I think, six different seasons that we've pulled some of the best tips for you when you become a member. And Greg, what are some of the topics? Well, we've got, you know, taking a soil sample, which is a, a, an essential thing to do when you're just starting out gardening because you need to know what your soil is like. So Bob will kind of walk us through that. Uh, there's things like how to prune fruit trees, something that you might want to be considering doing later this year after the trees stop growing. Uh, raspberries, getting rid of buckthorn. Uh, canning demonstrations, growing garlic. There's 20 different tips on this DVD. And you can have that, or maybe you've had a good harvest this year. You need some ideas for what to do with your veggies? Well, we've got a great opportunity there. Yes, on this special edition of our Fall Harvest Moon Special for Great Gardening, when you are a supporting member of WDSCWRPT and you give that $75 pledge, you get that DVD of the garden tips, or we're having the special WDSC cookbook offer featuring F is for the Fall Harvest, which is so fitting for this time of year. And it's got lots of great recipes. So if you've got uh, a great bell pepper crop, I heard they had up in Kiwaten, well, you might just find some recipes in here so you'll know what to do. Britt, I know you like to just, you, you chop all, all your veggies up and throw them in a big salad, and that always works out <laughs> well. But there's lots of ways to use those vegetables. You might also want to consider supporting the station tonight and Great Gardening at the $120 membership level. And then you'll get both the Great Garden DVD tips and the cookbook no choices to make there plus you'll also get the WDSC member card. That's right and really tonight we're encouraging your support because as a gardener you understand what it takes to maintain something that you enjoy your gardens your vegetables your flowers it takes a lot of tending and a lot of love and so we hope you consider sharing your love and support through a contribution tonight and get some great thank you gifts along the way. Think of it as if you're fertilizing great gardening for the upcoming season that money helps to fertilize the show helps us to produce these programs I know Pam and Judy the 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 producer and uh, director of the show have been busy all summer long gathering more uh, gardens from across the region and working on segments that we'll see next spring. Uh, but that continues, you know, and it does take uh, financial support to keep programs like this going. So make that call right now. You can see the numbers right there on your screen, 218-788-2844, or toll free, the number is 1-877-307-8762. You can also pledge online. You see our website there, www.wdsc.org, and you'll find a handy way to pledge right there when you go to that website. And becoming a sustaining member is a really wonderful way that you can make an affordable contribution each and every month. Uh, as you see on the screen, a $10 per month membership gets you the DVD of tips and the cookbook, F is for Fall Harvest, and it's an ongoing pledge of support until your credit card expires. That's right, and what you can do is just let us know that you'd like to become a sustaining member, and we can take that monthly out of your credit card, as Britta mentioned, or we can also take it out of one of your bank accounts. It's easy to do, just takes a few minutes, and then you kind of don't have to worry anymore about your membership uh, expiring. Yeah, I kind of think of it like I have at home an automatic sprinkler. It just takes <laughs> care of what needs to be done. I don't have to worry about it. Right, exactly, exactly. We just have a couple minutes left before we'll be getting back to great gardening. So don't let this opportunity pass you by to help fertilize great gardening for the coming season. Make that telephone call of support right now and then enjoy the rest of our great gardening Harvest Moon special. You know, I love Bob and Tom. They always have so much great information to share with all of us. And it's a really wonderful resource to have a show that's localized for our area. I mean, living along Lake Superior is really unique, it if is. not challenging. And it's really nice to have that accessible information through the Great Guardian program. And if you're a fan, and if you're someone who appreciates this service and program, consider being a supporter today through a contribution. We'll run through those membership levels. You see the $75 garden enthusiast level where you can have either the DVD of the tips or the cookbook. At the $120 level, you'll get both the DVD and the cookbook. And of course, every pledge of at least $120 also gets the member card with a lot of great benefits. And we also have the sustaining membership level at $10 per month where you just let uh, your credit card or bank account do the work and each month we'll uh, take $10 and put it towards Great Gardening and the other fine programming here. We also have a basic membership pledge if you want to just get your feet wet and uh, get started with supporting the programming. That's our $45 membership level. And everybody that pledges tonight at at least the $45 level will receive the This Month magazine. So some great reasons to call, but the most important one is to support programs like Great Gardening. And guess what? There's more to, of the show coming up right now.
Welcome back to our Harvest Moon special edition of Great Gardening. I'm here with garden experts Bob Olin and Tom Casper, who uh, both faced a challenging season, much like all the gardeners out in the Northland. But you guys did it, of course, with enthusiasm and optimism. A little frustration, though. You want to talk about that? Share, share any of those frustrations? Well, you know, we obviously have a short season, particularly for warm season crops. And this way you want to kind of balance things off. You always want some cool season crops because they're going to flourish, which so many of them have this year. But we always tend to get the heat that we need. It's just you can't miss it. This year we got it in the uh, a couple of weeks toward the end of May that you kind of had to capture. If you capture those two weeks before it cooled down in June and the plants got established, we were okay and we finished off. But some crops did extremely well including those that didn't ripen, these, like the peppers. Well, look at these peppers. I, I mean, uh, normally you take uh, need some heat to grow these. Well, it was a great pepper year, bell pepper year, because uh, we typically in this area eat them green anyway. So mm -hmm. they didn't ripen and mature a whole lot, but they sure did yield. So that was, yeah. that was a pleasant surprise. And uh, lots, lots of good potatoes. Potatoes and garlic, and so many of these were kind of a mainstay for this mm -hmm. area. And they, they're all cool season crops and uh, they did spectacularly this year. All right. Well, we have some viewer questions related to some of these crops, but also one that we got a picture with, and it comes from Lori Scow. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, and Lori said she has what she thinks is a weed coming out of her pond. Noticed it in early May after she cleaned it out and started up the pond. It's long grass-like stalk with three leaves branching out at the top. So what kind of a weed or plant is that? And we talked about this for a little bit. It's probably a sedge. Uh -huh. Pretty common to see those grasses, and a lot of ornamental grasses are in the sedge family. Could easily have seeded in from a neighboring landscape or a neighboring garden. Easy enough for Lori to control if she wants to remove it, um, either digging it by hand, making sure she gets all the root out of it, or treating it with a... Uh, non-selective kind of herbicide will also take care of it very easily. So Great. Lori has another what she calls a weed that grows randomly in the yard with uh, reddish clover-shaped leaves and petite yellow midsummer flowers. Yeah, and that's an ornamental clover. Um, many of our garden centers uh, in the region have sold that as an annual. It does very easily self-seed into the garden and can really take over. So folks that are buying this in a garden center really need to make sure that they're keeping an eye on it. Mm -hmm. Once those flowers form, those yellow flowers form, it actually, the, the flowers explode to disp dispense the seeds and she can end up, or gardeners can end up with this all over the place. In the <laughs> okay. Uh, Kay from Duluth wants to know why aren't my beets and turnips producing any roots? They have lush greens, but no beets or turnips underneath. Well, again, it could be a couple things. It could be a function of the season. Uh, but I'm suspecting she got them planted pretty tight. They're pretty close or there's weed competition. Usually when we don't get that, uh, that root to set up, there's a, a crowding effect that's going on. That in addition to the stretch we had in June. But I think it's more crowding than anything. Okay. Bob from Duluth wants to know what kind of soil mixture to use for a tomato garden. Well, for tomatoes, I think really um, the big thing is good drainage and then you want it to be slightly acidic. The ideal pH is about 6.8, just a little bit below neutrality. And then an organic level of about 20% or so. And then the big thing is full sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Linda from Duluth has a hardy hibiscus that has a lot of buds. Should she prune it now or leave it? Well, if it's got a lot of buds, prune it or don't prune it. Enjoy <laughs> those flowers because sure. uh, again, a lot of our perennials are blooming late this season uh -huh. and that one is notoriously late. So uh, sit back and enjoy those flowers and hopefully we don't get frost and, and then late in the season she can prune it back. So. And then the uh, same similar question about the strawberry hydrangea. Um, should it be pruned now? It's just starting to bloom so again it must look nice. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy the flowers. Right. Uh, prune it in the spring. And that, yeah, that probably came on uh, new wood this year, and she can yeah. expect the same thing. All the hydrangeas was a little confusing. Some are coming on old wood. Those buds get carried through the winter. Some are coming on new buds. Some are coming on both. So you kind of have to be a little bit selective. But if you have blooms late in the season, as you say, enjoy them, and the pruning really occurs in the spring. So uh, real quickly, are you saying the weather's kind of confusing these plants? Well, all of us. We're all confused. <laughs> we're all confused. <laughs> <laughs> What's really confusing, some of these newer varieties, it's just that the buds on the new varieties aren't consistent. In other words, some will, have, will be forming early, some will be forming late, some on new wood, some on old wood, and 
sometimes on the same plant. So you yeah. really have to take a look and if there's a bud there, let it go and let it mature and enjoy the bloom. All right, we've got a, an email question about green peppers and another question uh, from, well, maybe it's the same one in Kewatin. A uh, really good crop of bell peppers this year. Uh, what do we do to preserve the rest of them? Um, Joe has 27 plants wow. of, of green, green peppers. And you know what? We have a cookbook that's hey, available as a go. gift tonight, in fact. That is for fall harvest, and that probably has some ideas. Um, I know that my family would... Um, would slice them up and fry them in oil, and then you can even um, freeze them in the oil in a, in a freezer container or can them. If Sounds nice and healthy, Pam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Olive oil is delicious. Olive it's good oil for you. Good for you. you know, <laughs> a little garlic. <laughs> good point. You know, we are talking about this potential frost coming up, and you should be aware that the pepper plant itself is very frost sensitive. Mm -hmm. A lot of them really haven't a chance to size up, so mm -hmm. cover those, protect them. Another thing I've done is just Take them, slice them up, spread them on a cookie pan, freeze them down that way, put them in a, a Ziploc bag, poly bag, and then you can just pull it out and add them to yeah. your eggs in the morning, Tom. Yeah, good. And, and Joe <laughs> was from Key Watton, so they are talking about 28, 29 yeah, up there. Yeah, get out there and cover so them. So they want to cover Watton. those 27 cover them up plants. Or, yeah. or bring them in, right? Yeah. All right. Well, more questions coming up later, but uh, right now we want to go back to a garden in Bayfield that came together through a partnership with a local landscaper. Here he is to tell us how it was done. And it was very bad soil. So we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of good compost from a farm. That's why everything's done so well. The soil's really rich, really enriched, down to about two feet. So that's what makes the difference, because the garden's only two and a half years old. And it was because it was like a three-dimensional garden in that you were going to be able to see it from all directions. There was, there was no front or back. So it was okay, we needed a, a source point for the water so the garden made sense. It must have an, a, an origin, if you like, and that made sense to have it up at the top. And we did terrace it to a degree to get enough fall on the different waterfalls and to get enough water flow. So we actually made it into two different ponds and got better flow through two, running it as two different systems. So we built that top, top set first and got that, got that in and, and to shape and then carried on down the hill with this set so that everything married into itself. And then we shaped the borders around. And we are quarried down in, uh, near Minneapolis. It's where Eden Stone comes from. And we use it a lot up here. It's a really pretty building stone. And then the, the, that's called Gold Streak. It's kind of got a greenier color and a little mica in it so it glitters with the water. So we use that in the waterfalls. That's the mainly stone. And then obviously the clear rock, the gravels from a, the, that's the local stone in this area. But it's more of a formal planting style. It's more of an English garden style, if you like, really. And so that's why the, the planting is in drifts. Because on a bigger scale, you must amp up your planting to create enough color on mass so it doesn't look too speckly, you know. The garden has a huge planting of lavender. We use lavender a lot as a backbone planting. So that came from, from local. So I try and source the per perennials locally if I can. It's amazing that it does so well. And it's such, a, it's such a nice flower for up here because it flowers later and goes right through September. So we had that, you know, that cloud blue running through the garden for a long time. And I love the Johnny Jump Ups because they just naturalize through and they're, they're a pleasure to have in the gardens. This, this one was, obviously was a real pleasure to build. John and Betty are really lovely clients to work with and so it was a, it was a very enjoyable. Gardens evolve, they're a natural thing. You know, they're a pleasure to make. It's not like building a house which is very specific and has to be to the to the inch, whereas a garden has so much more uh, free play. So they're yeah they're the pleasure at the end of a build. Is how I like to think of them. All right, well, beautiful look at that, and nice to see uh, how the uh, homeowners showed us around, and then the uh, landscaper told us how it was all done. It was yeah. a lot of fun to go see that garden. Well, and, it, and it's beautiful, the incorporation of the natural stone in that, whether right. it was the steppers across the creek or the walls. It was gorgeous. And we, we see that here in northern Minnesota with the use of bluestone and gabbro and, 
and even some of the taconite uh, uh, ore that people are using in landscapes now. So really kind of natural to our settings and a beautiful job. So. Right. Or in Duluth, it's just that natural bedrock. Yeah. Instead of cursing it, work around it. Work right? around <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the mostly wild crops that perform quite well this season is the choke cherry. And uh, we have a look at some that were picked by our program director, Julie Kellner, and her daughter, Maya, north of Duluth, near Cotton. We also have a recipe for choke cherry jelly on our website at WDSE.org. Bob, uh, you saw a lot of choke cherries out there as well. You know, again, it was that moisture, and, and I came by a patch, and I happened to have a five-gallon pail in the back of the car, and I stopped and just started harvesting. Mm. And uh, Harvesting was real easy. It's dejuicing, and it took a little bit of time, but nonetheless, right. <laughs> it, it was fun this year, for sure. It was a good season for them. Okay. Well, here's another delicious item grown for recipes or just for eating straight from the garden. It's the bean. Here's Bob with all kinds of them. It's kind of a, uh, a variety or group of plants that people don't really take a lot of look at. So we, uh, we looked at 41 different varieties, uh, everything from our conventional bush snap beans to our traditional pole beans, uh, some early maturing soybeans, as well as some of the dry shell beans. So uh, here we're mid-season in the trial, and we're hopeful that many of these will come in. All of these will be evaluating for yield, uh, disease susceptibility, as well as for uh, the quality of the finished product. People should be aware that all beans were initially pole beans, and these are beans because you really have to trellis that most people avoid or a lot of gardeners overlook, and I would encourage them to give that a try. You'll get higher yields per square foot. You'll get a little bit of a delayed harvest, and um, the quality is very fine on many of these. So we started with pole beans, and then uh, breeders worked them down to our, our bush, our snap beans, and that was mainly because of the advent of mechanical harvest. So most of the beans now are a little bit easier to handle. They're a little bit uh, shorter in stature. I'm surprised that our germination was really pretty good. We, beans have some insect, soil-borne insect problems, and we didn't experience that this year. But with all the moisture we've had and the, the damp leaf surfaces, we have seen a little bit more disease. But again, that gives us an indication of which varieties can withstand challenging uh, moist conditions. Well, we have to look for early maturity, and uh, it really depends on where you're located. We have a little bit more heat to the northwest of us in the Red River Valley, as an example, where there's significant shell bean production. But when we get here, and particularly along the shores of uh, Lake Superior here, it, it's all going to depend on the amount of heat that we get coming into the latter part of the year. I would start with some of your uh, basic, like your Great Northern, I think is a good variety. I think that uh, uh, fava beans, people should give those a try as well. I think you might want to explore. They are really uh, protein dense and uh, they're a great crop. I might mention that they are legumes, so they have this ability to naturally fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and uh, deposit it actually in what we call the soil atmosphere. So the shell beans are still growing? They're still growing. We'll try to avoid the frost and still try to get a season. All right, here's Quite hoping. frankly, they take a little bit more heat. This may not have been the ideal year to trial, but some of them are coming and they definitely have set up the seed. All right. Well, there's a website you can go to for more on the vegetable of the year, including a link to some really great recipes. And you can also go to our website to link to that website. Now, a lot of questions here, so uh, we're going to start really moving through them. Barb from Superior is talking about her squash that looked great in the spring, and then uh, it bloomed, grew five inches long, one inch diameter, and then fell off the vine. Yeah, we like to take a little bit look at the fruit. Again, we've had, uh, we've had a lot of issues with powdery mildew this year, mm. and we're seeing more of that. People really want to look into the catalogs and look for powdery mildew-resistant varieties. You know, I had a question um, that I held over from earlier in the season from Linda in Cloquet about peas that were badly infected with powdery mildew. And uh, she was wondering, can I compost the infected plants or is the soil con and is the soil contaminated with the fungus? Real good questions. No, this is foliar borne, so she definitely can compost if she's an effective composter. You want to get it inside the pile, you want the pile to heat if you can get 120, 130 degrees. If you don't feel you're really capable of composting, then I would I'd get them out into the, uh, the one of the landfills, or rather the uh, the uh, 
sanitary uh, facility where sure. they're actually commercially composted, they will get the temperatures higher and that will destroy the disease. And, and for people that don't know what powdery mildew is, mm -hmm. it's, it's a basically looks like somebody has dusted the foliage of your plants. Um, and we're going to see a lot more of that with the kind of summer and fall that we're leading into here. So people are seeing it on their squash and their melons and their lilacs and a lot of the perennials and things like that. Again, generally doesn't kill them, but can knock them down. So. Okay. Naomi from Duluth has some big dead patches uh, in her lawn that keep getting worse. Wondering if it's winter kill, bugs, do I have red ants? And, and she should really probably get somebody with a lawn care to come out and do okay. if it is cinch bug or, or if it is a, a fungal disease in her turf. Seeing some, actually some fungal diseases, some things like that. So she should really get somebody out to look at it to make sure. Of course, one of our sponsors is Evergreen. Uh, they'd come out and right. take a look at it and things right. like that. So before she goes out and treats for something that she doesn't have. Okay. If I may comment, uh, chinch bug, which we've had some problems with, is really characteristic of very warm seasons. So I'd go right back to, we got a complex of diseases called patch diseases, and that's probably what she has there. Haven't had that warm season to worry about. <laughs> Susan from Duluth uh, has black spots on the maple tree leaves. I know we saw some of that last year. Well, we call it tar spot, and again, it's, it's really a relatively benign. It, it doesn't do any, any real damage to the uh, tree itself. Uh, make sure super sanitation, get in and clean up all the leaves, get them well composted or off the site, and that's, uh, that's all there is to that, really. Okay. Um, some peonies. <laughs> that's all we've got. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. We know more. We're not telling. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot. We're going to keep dragging it out of you guys, okay? Peonies uh, formed buds this year but did not bloom. What should I do about that? I think that was uh, ki kiwi. Kiwi, yeah. I think was the name. And it saw that a lot too because of the lack of heat as those buds were forming. A lot of botrytis on peonies as well where entire branches were dying. Um, not to panic, as long as she had good foliar growth this year, it's probably going to be okay. Um, so nothing to worry about for this year and, and uh, just get them cut down here in a month or so and they should be fine next year. Great. But again, taking all that spent foliage that's infected potentially with the botrytis you mentioned, make sure that's either off-site or well composted. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you have to watch And off-site does not mean in your neighbor's yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you burn it? I mean, if you burn well, it, that's... That seems to be a solution for people, but actually you could kick a lot of these spores up in a burn pile. Oh, okay. So if you have to, you've got a couple of choices. Compost, if you really feel mm -hmm. confident. You could dig it in the ground because it's foliar borne as opposed to soil borne, or you can send it out to the yard waste disposal site where they can't ha handle it. Mm -hmm. Okay, really quickly, I'm getting, I'm getting the signal, but Kathy from Carleton wants to know about jalapeno peppers that have brown spots on them. What's going on there? All the peons, the jalapenos, again, they can be vulnerable to fungal disease, but actually there's a netting that forms over them. So that may be n part of the natural uh, formation of the jalapeno. Or, again, it could, be, um, it could also be blossom end rot this year where we've got a calcium deficiency. So we'd have to take a little closer look at the actual fruit to really say What she should do, make some salsa, bring it in, we'll take a close <laughs> well, look. We'll take a taste, <laughs> we'll see. All right, thanks much. Um, well, right now we want to take time for a look at what's coming up next season on Great Gardening. Take a stroll with us through a wide variety of gardens, from the masterfully manicured in Smithville, to a lush, lively haven on a lake in Carleton County. We'll visit a yard with a bonanza of bonsai and make our way up the North Shore to a garden with a superior view. Great gardeners can be found far and wide across the Northland. Also, a look at the legend and stature of the old-fashioned favorite, the hollyhock. You may be surprised at the number of new and old types of geraniums that can add vibrant color and form to your container. We'll see how the revamp of a neglected landscape for both private and public enjoyment in Bayfield, Wisconsin resulted in an aquatic setting even Mother Nature would be proud to call her own. And we'll take you to a local vegetable patch where persons with disabilities are learning firsthand the many rewards of gardening. A whole season of tips, tours, and expert advice beginning in March of 2015, 
on great gardening. All right, that's what's coming up next year. And uh, you guys will be back with a lot more information, but we're not done here yet tonight, okay? <laughs> to ensure a smoother start to next season, we do have uh, some information about what you can do now in preparation for that. And uh, there are chores to be done. Right, uh, fall as we uh, get into those cold attempts, cut those perennials down. A lot of people wait and hold them till next year, but it's much easier to do it now, especially if we get springs like we've had that are late and the perennials are already growing. So get them cleaned out late this fall, get them into your compost or down the compost facility. And we talked about that, destroy the, destroy the diseased materials. Yeah, and if you're not real familiar with composting, it's a fun kind of a process. You need some basic principles. We'll be doing a session a little later in the year on that, but uh, there are a couple of good reference texts out there. Get some good material, but uh, just don't put it in a pile. Try to, try to manage that a little bit. Tom, I bet your tools look great. Uh, uh, you probably shine them yeah, up. Yes, polished, and, uh, and I sharpen, make sure all your tools get a good look at them, you know. And, uh, of course, I like to visit some of the local uh, rummage sales looking for tools at a okay, great yeah. price because uh, that's always a good place to get them. Um, but making sure that they're in good shape before winter. So. And we, we missed the one that said water your trees and shrubs until the ground freezes, but we want to talk about the deer. This is a great picture and right. it's right in the city of Duluth and uh, this deer just hopped right over that fence and there's a doe behind, lots of deer problems. And I would say that that deer didn't have too tough a winter. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking pretty yeah. hard. Uh, no, uh, coming into the fall of the year, protect I happen to like fences, particularly coming into the fall for, for tender perennials, your new apples and whatnot. There's no substitute for a good yeah. fence of one type or another. Okay. Yeah, other, other seasons. Fence at all, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> there are solutions during the growing season that work a little better, but I, I fencing like, for the winter. Yes. All right. Well, we, we have just a minute to talk about a couple garden events coming up this fall, and uh, they include uh, one uh locally, Bean Garden Fest, and then one uh, on the range. Right. Uh, we are going to take a look at the year of the bean. We are going to talk a little bit about garden, uh, fall garden work, including composting there. Uh, we also have got a number of recipes. We're going to show you how to use both snap beans as well as shell beans. Then we're going up to Barris. Uh, these folks have been very gracious. There we're going to be talking about soil fertility, composting, growing great garlic, and controlling deer. All right, and we have details of all of that on our website. You can find a lot more information, or you can even go back and uh, visit some of our shows, which are on there as well. Well, we want to thank our phone volunteers, the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. We are uh, back to begin our next season of Great Gardening on March 5th. It'll be here before you know it. Uh, Bob, Tom, you guys probably still have a little work to do in the garden. A little bit. This week, huh? Yeah, tonight, <laughs> and in tomorrow night, tonight, tonight, tonight be interesting. Yeah, yeah, we'll see if the frost comes and uh, good luck with all of that. But thank you so much for all the information and inspiration that you provide to all our viewers and to all of us here. It's really a lot of fun to hear uh, what you have to say about uh, what's going on in gardening. And thanks to you, Pam, for all the great leadership. All the good folks here at the Public Television, WDSE, they all do a great job. It's a pleasure to work with you all. Oh, thank Amen. you. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to all who called in those questions. Stay tuned to find out how you can support Great Gardening and other local public television programs. From all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden. Well, Greg, I'm really sad that the great gardening season is over. They are really a bright spot on Thursday night, especially for the last two springs. You know? That's right, and with uh, that bitter cold season right around the corner, it'll be sad thinking that the gardens are being put to bed. But uh, right now, we hope that you have enjoyed a great season of great gardening. Glad you're with us this evening. I'm Greg Grell, along with Britta Edgerton. And right now, in just a couple of minutes, we'd like to encourage you to support the station and help kind of fertilize great gardening for the upcoming season with a financial donation. Consider making a pledge right now at the $75 membership level. And at that $75 membership level, you have a choice tonight. You can get either a, a DVD with 20 great gardening tips that have been featured over the past few seasons, or you can get your very own WDSC cookbook. And it happens to be our F is for fall harvest cookbook. So if you've had a good harvest, you've got a lot of vegetables that you're looking to 
come up with some new recipes, some new ways to use it, well, call right now and get yourself a, a fall harvest cookbook. Yeah, that cookbook is a great companion to the Great Gardening Show uh, for this season, and it is coming at that $75 level. But you can get both the DVD and cookbook tonight when you contribute and support Great Gardening here at WDSCW RPT with a $120 pledge. When you make that pledge of $120, you also get our member card, which briefly, you know, Greg and I are very familiar with this. This is like a coupon book. It is your way to get great savings at area restaurants and attractions throughout our viewing area. And it's a really great way to earn back your membership. That's right. So carry this card with you when you call in and make a pledge right now at the $120 level. It'll come with a neat little benefit book that tells you where it can be used. And there's also a website specifically for the member card because we're always adding new attractions and new uh, benefits that you might be able to take advantage of. And absolutely, if you use this, many of the restaurants offer two-for-one deals or maybe you'll get a free dessert or you'll get a percentage off. If you use this card enough, it'll pay for itself, pay for your membership, and it'll also help pay for programming here on public television. So what a great deal. So the full list is online at WDSC.org. So if you're going online to check out those calendar of events that Pam talked about earlier, also some of the tips for wrapping up your garden season, you can also go online and make that pledge of support for great gardening to ensure a great and successful season coming up next year in 2015. Or consider becoming a sustaining member right now. You'll also get the member card at this level. This is our $10 per month sustaining level. You'll get the cookbook and the great gardening DVD full of tips, but also your membership will go on and continue to support public television. This is at least a year commitment, but most, pe most people just let it go, let it grow, so to speak. <laughs> let it grow for public television. And each month we'll take $10 out of your credit card or your debit card or one of your bank accounts. You let us know when you call how you want to do that and our phone volunteers will walk you through the process. It only takes a couple of minutes to become a member, but then you'll have that great feeling of knowing that you've helped to fertilize public TV, you've helped to keep the station growing and growing strongly. So I just want to say thanks to Bob and Tom for making a great yes. show and all of our supporters who've made that commitment to great gardening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.